Everyone tells you how to sell, but no one tells you how to deliver. Everyone is talking about scaling a business in terms of more sales, more sales, more sales. And the point is not just the sales, the point is the organization. To delegate properly, you need to understand what you're doing. And the better you understand it, the better your process will be. Put a rule in your company that if you feel that you're not going to be useful to the meeting, don't come. Performance is related to KPIs, key performance indicators. But in most companies, the KPIs, they are invisible, they are difficult to establish, they are difficult to monitor. The problem is not how do I automate? It's what do I automate and at what time? Hi everyone, new episode of the Scale Talks. Today we are going to talk about understanding the power of systems. And we're going to do that this week with Ramzi Tapka who is going to tell us how he's working, um, not necessarily on how to scale his own business and on how to go from being one to being 500, which is something we see with different guests, but more on how he uses systems to help entrepreneurs and companies do that with their own business and leverage basically the, the magic of systems, let's be clear. So let's get started, hi. Hi, thank you. I like that introduction um, because, yeah, very ironically, I work alone, so I chose not to scale. I have some, uh, I have some assistants that help me out, but I chose to stay solo on this business. But um, I, I, I do help uh, companies um, find their own way to hire and to scale and to delegate that work. So to restart from the beginning. So uh, where, yeah. where where do you come from? What's yeah, what's yeah. the background? Very very quickly. Basically, I was uh, born in France, lived there for most of my life up until two years ago. And I have been helping, um, sorry, I have been uh, working in project management for 10 years, I think, before I went into consulting. Uh, I've always been a freelancer. I've always been a consultant, but I've never had a, a service business that's branded under my own agency, my own name. Uh, I've always come as a freelancer that's a part-time project manager or product owner. So mainly working with uh, digital teams. So uh, working between the business developers, UX designers on the web projects, on how to bring projects from A to Z and uh, very often using agile methodologies and scrum. So I've been doing that. I've done that in the past um, for about eight years, nine years, I think. And then two years ago, with my move to Lisbon, where we are, um, I've switched my business to helping um, companies um, scale and streamline their projects and processes with all the knowledge that I had in the past. So it fitted more with my personality and I chose to do that because I've, uh, I've been bored of this life of being project manager where you're three years on the project, it lasts a very long time. I know that I have personality that I am very um, short term minded. I like to jump from project to project, from pro idea to idea. I like um, just to hire, get new clients and projects that are more like two weeks to two months than uh, one year to three years. Okay, so let me slow you down for a second, right? Um, that's the mindset of the guy. We're going to come back to that next. Um, let me rewind a little bit and get back to something you, you said just before. You're working with web companies, web agencies. Um, how do they work? What makes them kind of special? How is it, what makes it possible for you to actually help them with the, the, the systemization that we were talking about? And second part of the question, um, we're not just talking to people here who basically have a web agency. So how is what we're going to talk about actually applicable to pretty much anyone with their own business? Um, yeah. So for more context, I started with large companies. So with uh, very big companies working as a product owner, or project manager. And very often these companies have a very solid processes. They want to follow a book. They want to follow the Scrum methodology or the Agile methodology. And it's very strong frameworks where you have to do recurring week daily meetings or you have to do have a retrospective sprint planning blah 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 so all of this structure i saw it and i saw it into these companies and i saw part of it worked and it had 
a lot of positives because you cannot scale if you don't have processes because um, you need to let managers have a bird's eye view and without everyone working on the same frameworks, they can't really. It's it's a question of trust the process, basically. Yeah. We're not letting anyone, everyone just do random and any way they want. We have a That's process, it. we trust the process and the process is, we don't know really where it's going to get us, but it's going to get us somewhere. Yeah. Basically, uh, I was reporting, for example, for a project for one of these companies to a chief digital officer, officer CDO, and that person needed to um, every week have the same type of meetings the same day where they're reported about the progress of their products portfolio. So you can't really do that if one team works one way and another another way and if their meetings are not on the same days. So I brought that structure to smaller com companies that I help now, which are m all kinds of companies, but very recently I'm making a focus on agencies uh, because I want to productize my service, but that's another story. I want to scale my own service, uh, not through hiring people, not through consulting, but by turning it into a um, training program later. But basically, to summarize, that large company structure and these very strong and, and very uh, structured processes that are scrum, that are agile, I made them more lightweight to bring them to smaller companies and mid-sized companies that want to scale. Yeah, because the that agile methodology and the scrum methodology are methodologies that are made for project management, IT management, mm -hmm. um, things that are pretty sophisticated. Yeah. And they work when you know the concept. So they're pretty, not lightweight, they're pretty heavy. Right? Yeah, they're very heavy. And so there is a, a challenge and a big stake, which is how do we use something that works but that's heavy and how do we just keep the, the core of it to make it available to smaller structures that's the point yeah that's the point and that's exactly where i'm at right now what i'm trying to debunk because yes they are tied to very often it teams and a specific industry but i've realized why does doesn't every company work in sprints or batches call it however you want uh, because that way of working is actually makes sense, whether you're in marketing, whether you're, um, I don't know, any kind of service delivery business, you're doing marketing, you're doing ads, you're doing, um, you're even like cre creating trucks or any kind of indus industry, really, it could apply. The only downside of this processes of Scrum of Agile is that they're heavy. They are heavy indeed. It takes a lot of time to track everything. It takes a lot of time to estimate everything. So I wanted to bring a lighter, a leaner approach to this and kind of find a, a hybrid between very lightweight, very lean method and uh, what Scrum Agile is. Okay, so people right now are probably going to say, okay, why is that relevant? Mm -hmm. And because we're talking about systems and Agile and things that they're not necessarily using. Yeah. So, you know, like, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. why are we uh, spending our energy trying to listen to that? And yeah. I'm going to let you explain, but you said something when we, when we, we had a chat to prepare um, this discussion. And you said there is a big point, which is everyone is talking about scaling a business in terms of more sales, more sales, more sales. And the point is not just the sales, the point is the organization, because if you can't secure and scale the delivery, mm -hmm of the process behind just selling, then you're not scaling anything. You're just fucking it up. Excuse my French. Yeah. So that's the point. That's the whole point. So I, I had a, I had a tag, tag line in my head recently. It's like, everyone sells you how to sell, but no one tells you how to deliver. Um, and everyone is focused on more leads, more sales. I want leads, I want sales. I want to learn how to sell. But no one is really focused on how can I deliver more efficiently? How can I deliver more with the same team without hiring? And for me, this comes from good processes, good planning, and possibly good automations. All of this creates a very powerful system. So processes, planning, and automations. Um, and that's what I want to bring. That's my philosophy. So my entry point, I'm, I'm leaning into more technical right now, but my entry point for this is a project software that I set up for companies. And in this software, I set up their solid 
processes, I set up the way to plan their projects, and I set up automations so that they save time from project tracking, basically. And that's the point of it. What's the, the starting point of system thinking? That's what we're talking about here, system thinking. We're mm. trying to think in terms of, okay, we have a business, we need to turn that business into a system, into an asset, yeah. into something that can work without us, right? Mm -hmm. it, the team is going to make it work, and so there is a need for, for a system. The starting point there is what? Is an entrepreneur saying, I want to go play golf, so I need to turn things into a system? Or it's an entrepreneur saying, uh, this thing is a mess, there is no system, we need to figure mm. it out? Or it's an entrepreneur who says, I'm a, I'm a geek, I, I need a system because that's how I think and there can be no option. Where do yeah. you start? So first off, I've realized a lot of very, well, e when you're an entrepreneur, either you're a very good visionary or a very good operational mind. And very often, if you're a good, strong operational mind, you need to be helped by a visionary. If you have a vision, you need to be helped by someone in operations. So either a COO or an external consultant or anyone. Um, now, how do you do you think in systems? Um, the way I see it is that your business is a tree. So you have a trunk, okay, the middle, which has to be very solid. And that's where the processes should be. That's where it should be a machine to grow in that middle. Now you, you have branches on the side of that tree and you should focus less on those because these will change as your company grows. So how can you make sure that that trunk is very solid? And it's kind of tied to Pareto's law, you know, 80-20. So 80% should be processized and 20% are variables that change over time. So focus, make sure this 80% is super solid, that everything is documented everything, you have videos for it, you can onboard easily your company on how to do this, build this trunk. Uh, you have automations to possibly build the trunk by itself. So make sure that this is solid, as, as solid as possible. Let me interrupt you for a second. I'm going to play the, the devil's advocate, but there's something I keep hearing from entrepreneurs when I, when I say that. It's, I don't want to build a system because I think a business should be about human people. And so we need to make sure that people can be people and systems are not people friendly. I don't want that. What do you say to that kind of entrepreneur? Um, I do get that a lot as well. So um, definitely, I'm definitely prepared and I've definitely changed my idea regarding this recently. So I think I'm definitely the kind of system thinker, thinker, thinker by design. Probably, I don't know why, I always had an operational mind. A friend of mine told me that recently. You have an operational mind. Yeah, everything you do, you want steps. So it's true that for some people it's more natural and for some people it's less. And it's true that it's not the whole truth. And there are truth in just like human connection and how do we work together and finding the right people. So first off, yes, people over processes, the famous sentences, I believe in it. And I think it's super important, but it doesn't say people over processes. It shouldn't be that. It should be people before processes, but there should be solid processes. So find great people and build solid processes. Um, and in terms of how you can change the mindset of people, I think it's you have to have a few key people that are already process minded at the right positions in your company and that are also human. So you have to have these A players uh, that are going to find that balance between both. And we're going to talk about the A players later as well. Yeah. And um, and basically, underneath that, there needs to be a lot of change management, a lot of training, patience, and making sure that everyone comes in and comes into the system to show them that it uh, it's actually to serve them and save them time and not the other way around. Um, and. I mean, the, 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 the business environment is changing right now with AI, with automation. And whether you want it or not, things are being systemized and automated. So, I mean, it's, it's also to everyone's, to every, everyone's consciousness, self-consciousness to be like, okay, I have to, I have to onboard on how companies are changing these days. Chicken and the egg. Where do you start? Do you start with delegating tasks to people? Mm -hmm. Or do you start with automation? I personally would say start by doing everything yourself once first. So to delegate properly, 
you need to understand what you're doing. And the better you understand it, the better your process will be because you will understand what is useless, what is useful, what to keep, what to remove, how to document it, uh, whether it's a video, whether it's a um, written SOP, whether I can actually automate it very SOP. easily. Standard operating process. So written standard operating process. Um, whether, uh, yeah, so whether I can automate it very quickly and I don't need to actually delegate it. So first, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a C-level person, try to do it once first, one, two, three, four times. Um, and also have a lot of faith in all the time that you will spend by doing it and documenting it is will actually will actually serve you x times later because i also end up in this situation i and a lot of people i know end up in this situation are like they do it and they don't document it they don't bother documenting it and they have or to do it yeah again. They have to do it again, uh, or they send a vo voice chat to to how to do it to their team, and it's not documented anywhere. And every time they send the same instructions, the same voice chat, and everyone is very in the instantaneity. No one thinks long term and how this little investment of time right now is going to serve their business uh, mu multiples. Another thing you said when we prepared the discussion was that the the point of um, system thinking and the point of working on not just the sales and the lead acquisition, but also the deliverability of the product, the mm. deliverability of the service in the end, is to, and that's very down to earth, right? It's to say we want to minimize meetings and we want to maximize focus. So we're talking about productivity as well. We're talking yeah, about KPIs and making sure the teams are there to do the really important stuff. Yeah. So the idea in... I'm going to describe very quickly the idea in my ideal work week, what it looks like. Um, to me, you're supposed to compress meetings as much as possible and to um, create rituals around your work week. So that's why I believe in a batch like method. So in IT, in Agile, they call it sprint. I like to call it batch because batch talks to everyone, like, you know, batch of work group. So what I would say is as a founder, you the way I would ideally work is you your week starts on okay, let's start from Friday. On Friday before, you plan everything that your team has to do for the coming week. On Monday after, you compress as many meetings as possible on that day. And I do believe a lot in zones of focus in your week and uh, Parkinson's law. So these two combine. Um, so Can the you first, explain the yeah, Parkinson's zone? The, the first Parkinson's principle of zones of focus is you enter a full zone of good productivity and good focus after around 20 minutes. So you need at least 20 minutes of slack time to enter that zone where you're actually going to do good work. And the second principle of Parkinson's law is that Um, the the work will fill the time that's allowed. So if you have meetings of one hour, one hour and a half, it will be filled during the one hour, one hour and a half. You unconsciously, people will stay one hour and talk bullshit towards the end. So that's why my the, the way I see my my work week is to that kind of solve these two problems. So the first one, uh, zones of focus, is like grouping everything on Monday, all your meetings, and then the rest of the week should be either either uh, fully focused work, or if you need to, obviously, one-on-ones, but only one-on-ones, not like meetings where, where no one is, is needed. So it's very simple. Um, an another rule that I saw on, on LinkedIn post recently and I like is if, like, put a rule in your company that if you feel that you're not going to be useful to the meeting, don't come. So that everyone has their own intelligence of saying, Okay, am I actually needed in that meeting or am I just going to be passive, answering my emails, uh, just uh, going to change the diapers of my baby and come back? No. Uh, in that case, you just don't come to the meeting and create some, so, some pragmatism about around what, how, like, uh, how many meetings you have. So solutions to that, as many meetings as possible on Monday. And the first meeting of the day should be the planning meeting where you plan the work week with your team. So Monday morning, you plan your work week. And the rest of the week, they know exactly what to do in that batch, in that week that you've planned. And the afternoon can be client meetings, one-on-ones, um, 
team meetings, this kind of meetings. So that's my philosophy of it. So if we summarize that, productivity in terms of system thinking by Ramsey is the day start, the week starts on Friday, then you rest for two days and then you get serious on Monday with the meetings provided that you are actually relevant to the meeting and then get the job done. Yeah, that's a good summary. Okay, that's an interesting week. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's that's the way I see it. But obviously, that's why getting back to A players, it requires A players. It requires people in your company that uh, you believe understand all your processes, understand how to do things, um, are independent enough, are autonomous enough, and get stuff done. Simple as that. So it comes from my own philosophy, and maybe I'm biased because that's the way I work and that's the way I want to work. But To be honest, I've been seeking, I've been seeking the truth in that realm for so long that I feel like I'm touching something here. Um, it's not very complex. It's very simple. Plan on Friday, Monday, compress as many meetings as possible and focus for the rest of the week. It's very relevant though, in terms of, um, in terms of starting a business and scaling a business because It's pretty often that you see an entrepreneur saying, oh, the, the, someone here in the company is doing that job. How is she doing? Not that good. Why do you keep her? Because she's my sister-in-law. And you're like, hmm. well, I, I, you know, that's, you shouldn't mix both. So it's not. Did you see that, that already? <laughs> of course. Yeah. Of okay. course. We, we see that in companies where yeah. people say like, we started with the people we had. And so it was just the way it happened. Yeah. And at some point, the point is not to say that you're working with friends and family. And so it's a big family and, and it's, it's great. Um, it's to say there should be seats and the right people on the right seat, period. Yeah. You need one CTO, can't be your brother. Has to be the right CTO, period. Yeah, yeah. This brings me to a, a, another point of productivity and performance. Now, I don't want to say we need to, uh, to watch people like it's uh, George Orwell times, um, but basically another aspect of that batch method that I have is um, estimation and capacity planning. And for now, I haven't found a way to, I mean, for companies to capacity plan properly in the coming one month how much their work, their team can deliver and know the planned versus done part. So no one actually knows what we planned versus what the performance of each individual. So the way I see it is you need to find a scale to estimate that work during the Monday's meeting. So say it's like uh, if it's a small amount of work, it's one point, medium amount, two points and high amount, three points. So you do that to each task for the week. And based on that, you will know over time, more or less, who is over or under that target, because you could say everyone is allowed 10 points per week, for example. And then under, obviously you understand why. It's not about telling them, hey, you're working more or less than you we planned and you're fired. It's about understanding why, but at least it provides a first point, first starting point of understanding people's performance. It's a big topic in terms of scaling companies because performance is um, related to KPIs, key performance indicators. And the big companies have them. They call it the OKRs as well. Mm. Um, and they manage to make them work because they have people who are actually paid to invent them and measure them and monitor them and be on everybody's back. But in most companies, the KPIs, they are invisible, they are difficult to establish, they are difficult to monitor, and in the end, even if they are here, they're more like, oh, that's the one we found because it's the one we found and it was too difficult anyway. So yeah. we said, this: if we do that, we're going to be good. And did you do it? Eh, depends. Yeah. I like that. I like the, that uh, phrasing, the KPIs are invisible. Very often companies do that. They, they create they, uh, fake OKRs and they don't follow them or they realize it's not uh, this, like it's not ac on tr actually serving them on track because business very often change over time. So you plan your OKRs on, in January, but in June, there might be a market opportunity that goes completely against that OKR. So that's why it brings us back to the systems. I think it's much more powerful to have a, a, a good methodology, a healthy company culture and, and working together rather than saying this is our target, we have to achieve it. Just um, as a reminder, OKR, 
stands for the objectives and the key results, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. they're kind of kind of related to key performance indicator. There is a distinction, yeah. but if you want to figure it out, just just Google it. Um, there is actually a, a big big book that's been written by the the Google teams because they the Google teams actually work with the OKRs quite a lot, so it's been documented. Yeah. Um, the opposite to KPIs and OKRs is to-do lists. Mm -hmm. What do you think about to-do lists? Um, I don't believe in them at all. <laughs> <laughs> I believe a lot in time boxing. So um, I think as as a manager, you need to have a high level planning because you need to understand what's the roadmap of your project, obviously, and breaking it down is the way to be able to assign it to the right people, to estimate it properly and everything. Uh, but when it comes to individual work, it's, again, it's very individual. It's very, very individual. It's how each person behaves, how each person deals with their own time, with their own productivity, with their own energy levels during the day. Uh, for example, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of a remote company that would allow anyone to have the, the work day they want. If they want to work from 5 p.m. till midnight, that's okay. If they want to work from 5 a.m. till 12, it should be okay as well. Because I think we ignore a lot that people function differently. A lot of people are early birds, some are uh, night owls, and you need to adapt to their energy level. Because if a person, by nature, doesn't like to work in the morning, is not going to be performant, you can't force them to do these specific tasks in their morning. Now, when it comes to personal to-do list, um, yeah, very often it doesn't work if you don't time box it. So I believe a lot in time boxing. I personally time box. I use a software. So what does it mean, time boxing? So I create my to-do for the week. And then I, um, on Friday again, I take these tasks and I slot them in my days, in my half days. And very often I double the time estimate because we always underestimate the time we're going to spend on something. So I take a task. There's, it's still a to-do list, but it's not like a to-do list that you tackle A, B, C, D, and it's just tick, tick, tick. It's just like tied to your time. So I know that Monday morning I'll work on this, Tuesday afternoon I'll work on that, and I have a rough idea of my week. Another way to, to, to look at that is to start from a year kind of perspective where you say, where do I want to be in a year? Mm. And usually people say, you know, we don't know where we're going to be in two months, so just, just stop bothering us with the year thing. And the best answer to that is, okay, I'll stop bothering you with a year. Where do you want to be in three years? And then it's like, ah, <laughs> you know, stop it. But the point is, three years is like looking over your shoulder yeah. and pushing people to say, where is it that you want to get that business? A few years from now, just think big, project yourself. And then three years is three times one year. So you can switch from three to one and say, mm -hmm. okay, at the end of the year, where are we? That's the big uh, step, milestone, milestone. And then one year is four quarters. Yeah. So it, you can start thinking in terms of what do we do for the, the next 90 days? Yeah. And the problem is that logic is pretty easy to understand. But then when you say to the teams, here is your 90 day thing, good luck. Everyone is lost and it doesn't work. Yeah. And so the thing that's missing in the logic usually is having people think in terms of where is it that they want the, the boss is where they want, what's the vision for three years, then how do we decompose it? And how do we turn that into something practical mm. that can be three months, but also one week at a time? Yeah. And it becomes what you're talking about. Yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, it's basically like a, an organism, you know, you take the body and then you enter in a more atomical level each time. So you go a little bit down each at each company level that you that you go down. That's how it should be organized. And this brings me to personal productivity. So a method I've started to use as well. It's called the 12 week year. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's a book. I forgot the 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 author, but I actually uh, did a video about it recently on YouTube and the idea is that we have a hard time comprehending where we can be in a year, um, but we have a much easier time say, thinking where we can be in 12 weeks. So you could consider a year is 12 weeks, and in and the end of that 12 weeks, at the end of that year, how do I want to feel? Where do I want to be? Where do I envision myself? Where is my business? And from there, you split that down in weekly goals, 12 yeah. weekly goals. And from these 12 weekly goals, you break it down again in daily tasks. So, yeah, kind of connected. And the exercise actually starts now. If you think about it, 
You, behind the screen, <laughs> where are you in three months? You have two hours. That's it. That's, That's it. it. Uh, very few people do that exercise. And uh, yeah, it's, it brings me to the idea of, of habits and rituals. You know, nature works in cycles. And everything we've been talking about so far, systems, everything, it's, it's a cycle. It's, it's really a full circle always. It's how uh, do I plan my year, I mean, three years, year, uh, turn it into s small cycles of 12 weeks, turn it into weekly cycles that we've been talking about. Um, and how are my systems? Basically, a system is also a cycle in itself because you create it, you improve it, you create proper your processes. But then you think, okay, is this correct for how my company is right now? And you, then you iterate on it again. And a process, an automation, a system, anything around that, that realm, that, around that topic, it's never forever. That's what people think. People assume that, oh, I've built my process, I've built my system, now it's solid, it works. No, but it's, it's temporary. It's and you always have to work on it again. And that's, it's, it's counterintuitive because you could say, oh, but it's supposed to save me time or it's supposed... Yes, it will, because once you work on it again and again, a lot of people are going to join that system that you're building. So that's the delegation that's going to save you time. It's not the system in, in itself. The system is going to be a lot of time spent on it, but the, the, the power of it is going to be um, yeah, ex extremely, extremely strong over each people that, that follow it. And the issue is that if you don't do it, then the teams that don't have those systems are going to go away because they're going to say nothing is working. There are no processes. There are no systems. There are no visions. We have a, we actually had a, a, a manager once who said, you know, if there was a vision in the company, it didn't get to us. So <laughs> we just do the daily whatever. Mm. But if tomorrow someone is offering us another job with processes and the team that knows why, why they come to work will take that job. Yeah. So there is the impact is big. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, this brings us a bit to the topic of people. I feel like uh, everything I've been talking about is. Uh, I feel like a bit of a robot. You know, you should create systems, automations, and everything. And this is not. I mean, I've realized over time this is definitely not where the the, uh, the whole truth lies. People imp are are extremely important, and making sure that they do have a purpose in that company is very important that they have a why, that they know where the company is going, um, that they feel good, obviously, like all of the all of the company culture aspects. So, yes, like focusing on system and processes is not going to work is that if that those people are not embedded, if those people don't understand what's behind it. Um, That's because you can't have a process without people. Yeah, it's it's really like both intertwined, both living together and the, the, the process being at the service of the people. Can you come back to the term you were using earlier? You said A players, and when we, we had a discussion before yeah. that episode, you were talking about champions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, okay, so I, I'm going to enter in a specific detail right now, but I s help companies set up their systems and, and, and scale their, their delivery through a software called ClickUp. It's very similar to Notion, Jira, Asana, so these project softwares. Uh, I like this software because it's very solid in terms of structure, but it also allows for a lot of customization, automations. You can really build a strong system with it. So um, every time I start to the client, I tell them, do you have a ClickUp champion? Do you have a champion? And this is not really a cl ClickUp champion. It's it's just a, a pretext, like a, uh, a way to say, do you have someone that actually will be the, the, the shield to, to strong processes that will protect the strong processes. Is it about having accountability as in um, we need to know that someone is there to make sure the process is uh, established and implemented? Or is it a question of having someone who's there to say, don't touch my process, respect the no, process? I think it's about having someone as a as a founder or as a as a very very, very C level, having a few people, depending on the size of the company, of course, uh, I don't know, maybe one per twenty, one per thirty, I don't know the ratio, but a few people that you trust enough that they make sure the processes and automations that you've built are working, that they are up to date, and that it serves the people that are working in your company. So these are basically very um, 
intelligent project managers, intelligence both in terms of logics and operations, but also in terms of uh, emotional intelligence and dealing with everyone's frustrations. So their their job is basically to be the the guardian of the temple. That's it. Right. That's how I, 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 I like to call it like that as well. So they, they are the guardian of the temple, of your processes, of how everything is done in your company, of the software you're using. Is it used to the best practices? Are we actually tracking everything we want to track? And this brings us a bit, a bit to project uh, software, but in project software, um, you don't need to track everything. You need to track what you need and uh, you need to keep things lightweight. So keep things as simple as possible. But and like if you do that, you will understand that the project software is actually great. Because very often, a lot of companies set up a project software in Notion, um, ClickUp, whatever, any one of them. And they're like, it's a mess. We don't understand how it works. We've, like a consultant came in and said that's that for us, but we don't know how to use it. And yeah, the thing is people come and build like super solid uh, warehouses with 50 custom fields to fill for every task. And in the end, no one uses it. So keep things simple, create a lightweight way to track how your work is done and um, have someone that makes sure that over time this is, um, this is, this is followed up. And I want to stress that that A player, that person, that champion, they are mandatory in a company. Like a company cannot scale without that. And very often people think, oh, it's the job of um, just someone that's also a designer or a project manager or I don't know. But it's not, you cannot have this hat and another hat. It or It's almost a full-time job. It's a full-time job to, to be this person. To be practical, um, what's, the, what's the job title for that kind of person? Is it like a CTO, COO? And also, uh, is it, it, um, in yeah. small companies, how do, you, how do you handle that? So in, in a very small companies, it can be a COO that then is going to delegate to, um, I don't know, operation manager, um, or project manager, but with that specific focus in mind, not the actual, um, not the actual operations. I mean, not the actual delivery, but making sure that the flow works. So it really depends how you want to, you can call it COO, you can call it project manager. It depends on the company, um, size, but that's how I would define it. The guardian of the temple. Um, of your processes, of your project software, of uh, your systems, of your automations. So the champions, the A players, the guardian of the temple, they have two roles. One is going to be the operational know-how. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the one you just mentioned, which is um, the emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. What is emotional intelligence and why is it important in that case? Well, first off, to, to me, it's very important to become friends with the people you work with. I'm not saying you have to go every day, have beers together, but at least have um, respect and appreciation for each other as human beings. Because if there is an animosity, if there's something personal in the, bitten, in, in the middle, nothing is going to ever work. Every time you're going to be in a meeting, you're going to hate each other. So obviously it's hard. There are situations like this and I... Uh, you need to find your own way to deal with situations like this, but try to befriend everyone. Um, I know in American culture, it's much more natural to just befriend everyone. In European culture, it's, it's a bit less, but I think it does help. And emotional intelligence, be, because, yeah, you need, to, you need to understand everyone's pains. You need to understand what's their problems, why this is not helping them and serving them. And you need to, to dig deep into the why of the why of the why. Very often you go to the to the very root causes of their problems and then you, you, you find a solution to it and you iterate over your processes based on it. So it takes a lot of listening skills. It takes a lot of good questioning skills, like knowing how to um, ask the right questions to the people to come up with some some solutions. And it takes also a bit of emotional intelligence because you need to understand who are the people that are actually working well and serving your company and who are actually destroying things and parasites because it does happen that there are parasites, sadly. And by parasite, I, I, I mean someone that not necessarily wants to, but has a personality that basically um, doesn't serve the other people team workers, the other people in your company that actually uh, scares them or 
makes them less efficient or makes them want to go away because they're they're not happy at work. So there can be some people like that that are a bit self-destructive. So you need that that person, that A player, that guardian of the temple need to be aware of this and know how to deal with that person. There is also um, related to the um, emotional intelligence a point that we use a lot actually that's that's about profiling mm. um, and behavior tests in the sense that it's not about saying, you know, um, this guy is an ass or he's crazy and we have to fire him. It's a question of saying he's not crazy, he is himself. And let's try to understand how he thinks, how he yep. behaves. And when you do that, you realize that this manager that you put into place to build the department, he's screwing it up, not because he's a, a dumbass, but because in the way he thinks, he has a mindset that's about process, the, which sounds good, right? Because you want him to build the department. The problem is that guy needs to have the process in place already to feel good. And when you're asking him to invent the process, he's completely lost. Hmm. And that's part of the emotional intelligence that yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it takes a lot to understand the strengths and weaknesses of everyone and knowing how to put the right people together. It's... Um, T to be honest, this is probably the biggest challenge even for me as 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 a consultant because, yeah, sometimes I come very often, I, I set up something great at a client and I realize I don't have the power or I don't have the, maybe also the knowledge or the experience to help them on that more human aspect on how are the people going to execute, how are they going to operate uh, happily, efficiently together. So it's uh, it's uh, I think it's a lifetime learning the human aspect. It's so much more complex than systems. So that gets me to my next point. We started from okay, let's crack the code of um, system thinking, and progressively, if you're still following us, we've been saying okay, system thinking is about building processes for the right reasons, with the right methods, but it's also about putting the right people in the right seat because mm -hmm. just the process is nothing. Which gets us to the next point, which is uh, kind of typical in the in, in the scale talks. It's first business and then mindset. And again, when we prepared this discussion, you said automating is a, isn't hard. Yeah. Um, automating isn't hard, uh, but you know need to know when and what to automate. That's the hardest part, I think. Um, Automation in itself, nowadays we have very powerful softwares, we have AI, we have no-code softwares, uh, a lot of um, softwares already have automation features inside them that allow you to easily, I don't know, uh, like uh, send email campaigns just from a click and uh, it, it goes. And the problem is not, like, we, we have the tools in our hands, all of this is available. The problem is not how do I automate, it's what do I automate and at what time. Because very often it's more efficient and serves more the company to delegate than to automate. Um, because because the, the system, I mean, the process itself, the, 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 the variables in themselves are changing, ever evolving. And if you start to automate something, you might, might actually slow your flexibility down. Because you create this funnel of how everything's supposed to work, how my I don't know how my client onboarding works, supposed to go through A, B, C, D, E, F. And then you do this super military process and it's all try in done in the software, it's amazing, and then in the out in the output your client is onboarded. But then the customer satisfaction might not be the best because you chose that specific way of doing it. Whereas if you let your uh, I don't know, your sales team or your onboarding team do it and come with feedback and understand how we can improve our onboarding and um, how we can perfect it. Then either you choose to automate it because you understood exactly how it's supposed to work or you keep the delegation because it's working very efficiently by, by itself with humans. So it's really about making decisions between what do you need to, to bring to a software? What do I need to bring to people? But at the yeah. end of the day, the... Um the return on investment, right? Tomorrow I, I come to see you and I say, hey, Ramsey, can you help me build systems in my company so that yeah. it scales better? The return on investment is not about your system. It's about whether me as the client, 
I'm going to be able to shake things up. It's whether I'm going to be able to say, okay, if I do that, everyone's going to be upset because I'm going to change their habits. Never mind. We need to do it. It's change management. Yeah. Change management management is important. And the, the, the way I see it is, I think it pro this is pro the problem is this is probably a bias because this is tied to my personality and the way I like it. But the way I see it is the the, the stronger the, the leap of faith that you take, the faster you can make choices and make decisions and make moves. So if you need to change, you realize this process is totally not working and you want to start for a clean slate. This is a bit radical, but try to do it as fast as possible. Sometimes it helps to take big leaps of faith and to just bring in all the company together into a new way of working. And if it doesn't work, it's okay. It's okay if it, you, st you tried it for a year and it doesn't work, this methodology or this process or whatever. But at least you saw how it was as a full organism together with that method. Because if you sometimes if you onboard on a certain way, a certain method, one department and it works for them, you think it's going to work for everyone, but it totally doesn't for the others for so many factors and reasons. So try to do radical shifts when you, when you bring in a new way, when you bring in a new system. And then, yes, this brings us back to change management. You need to be with uh, the right people. Obviously, like uh, change-minded people are... It's like the ability to change is probably one of the most powerful skill and one of the most important hiring skill um, that should be. The ability to learn, the ability to change. These two are much more important than the hard skills of the person, I think, in my opinion. But so if... I did my hiring, so I've got my team and I come to see you and I say, can you do that system, build that system for me? And turns out I didn't do my hiring well. And some people in my team are really against that. Your priority is going to be what? To change my team, as in educate them and make push them to think differently? Or are you just going to keep them as they are and you're going to adapt the system around them? Mm. <laughs> I don't want to answer that, but I think it's always a bit of both. So um, very, very often, uh, I mean, from now, since for, from a few few months, every new client I take in, I have a disclaimer and I have a whole page where I explain change management, where I basically tell them that this is a contract between them and me. I will provide the best quality of service possible in building their processes and this system. And they need to find someone internally to um, ensure that this will be applied, that that uh, there will be a dynamic of change in the company. I am here to help at any moment for any question they have, any decision making they have. If I can counsel them, I will. But I can't be the one as an external consultant, as an external provider that comes and change the company. It needs to be someone internally. Um, I It's good to hire me because if you hire an external consultant, you say implicitly to everyone, this is serious. This is an important initiative we're taking right now. You all need to be on board. So it already strengthens things. And people change their mindset compared to if you do it internally. So yes, I bring that. But You need to have these A players, bring us back to A players. You need to have these champions in the company that make sure that things work together. And I will not be the one making the change. It has to be internal. If we try to wrap this up, um, so we've been talking about system thinking and we've been talking about how you can, how you can use um, building, the building of systems to scale a business. We've said that scaling Uh, contrary to what people think, is not just about increasing sales. It's about building the, the delivery capacity and making sure that you can um, actually act on those sales that you're doing. We've talked about the importance of delegation and automation, and one comes with the other. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the method. Um, it's not about saying you have to do A, B, C within a year. It's about guiding people to make sure that they know what they're going to do, what they have to do, and they can check the boxes and, and do it in a smart way. It's not a to-do list, it's a, it's a batch, batch kind of logic. There is the operational know-how, there is the emotional intelligence, as in it's not just like shut the fuck up and do it, it's be, be smart about how you're going to push it. It's about saying that processes take people, 
Mm. And those people have to be the A players that you choose well. Yeah. What's the question I forgot to ask? I think that's a great that's a great summary, to be honest. Um, if, if I were to conclude with one last thing, is that if you listen to all of this, it's a lot. It's intimidating. It is a lot. Um, my last point of philosophy is to keep things simple. As paradoxical as it sounds, keep things simple. Keep your system, your philosophy, your automations, your delegation simple. Don't add a lot of conditions, detail, words, just like a few bullet points, a few how-tos, uh, very simple methodologies, very simple frameworks will work more, much more efficiently than creating, uh, like leaving this podcast and saying, I'm going to create a powerhouse with every single point I'm going to document it. No, just keep a lightweight, start with a lightweight system and see if it serves you. That's the way. That's a lot to do. You know what to do next. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank I, you for I really insights. enjoyed it. And we'll do um, the usual thing. We'll put all the information just down below so people can find you if they want. And you know the thing. Just uh, just click, just follow, and we'll see you in the next video. See you next Thanks. time. Bye.